Shabbat shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the fourth yom of the first month on our Creator's calendar, which happens to line up which, with uh, the 16th of March, 2024, on the Gregorian calendar. And we may know what year it is, but uh, we're not quite willing to disclose that yet as an official stance on anything. We are still trying to reckon uh, exactly what Yobel or Jubilee year it was that our Mashiach came in. If we can identify for certain that it was the 80th Jubilee or Yobelim, then we can reasonably know the exact year we're in today based on the Zadok calendar. But that's something that we're still trying to square away. However, this is a section of the Apostolic Constitutions that covers what to do on Pesach and unleavened bread. <clears throat> and um, this is the only place that I know that goes into great detail. A second, third, and fourth witness of this very fact, though, is in what we call the Basora itself or the Good News account. If you read them with an unbiased mind and you actually look into the original languages and the, the meaning of the text there, you're going to find that it lines up right with what is here. So, Ab William, this will be beneficial and edifying for everyone. But this is the Apostolic Constitutions, Book 5, Section 3. I said, this is corrected to conform to the Zadok calendar found at Qumran. We call it the Zadok calendar. It's really our creator's calendar. It was given to the sons of Zadok or Aharon to keep. And they were the ones that were supposed to be enlightening the children, right? Since it had been tampered with to add some pagan feast days like the Epiphany, the birthday of Antiochus, Lent, the weeping of Tammuz, and etc., and to try to show the sixth day to first day falsehood that does not add up to three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. The unedited version of the first section is in the original comments, and this was a post that I had originally made. All right. I did this for everyone to compare for themselves. The whole can be viewed online, and you can find multiple different places where this information can be found. So it's not something I'm trying to hide or tamper or change that is uh, no. trickery. It's literally just adjusting the dates back to the dates that are in the Qumran calendar for his literal Passover. When you do that, all the, all the Basora accounts and everything line up when you look at the words and how they're supposed to be translated accurately. And just to be clear, quite often you'll have tertiary definitions or third tier definitions that are inferences and not even the real meaning of a word as the literal translation they put in the English for you to deceive you into thinking things that are not true. Um, one example is where they put first day of the week where it literally should say one of the sabbaths which we'll we'll see in just a moment but there's other places where they'll say like they were keeping the pesach on the day instead of saying before the day of the passover they're saying the first of and that word for before or first is actually the same word in Greek, and it's the same word in Hebrew. The Hebrew word is kadem, kof, dalet, main, and it means to bore through east, like the, the first, the first inklings of the, the light, right? And to be before. The inherent meaning is before or first, but it's entirely based on context. And you have to be mindful that there's four accounts that are not contrary or contradictory to each other. And when you do that, everything lines up just fine. But that's the problem that we have. You have multiple accounts with different meanings for the same words that kind of confuse things. And then you have people who intentionally teach things that just are not based on what is written. 
and I, I don't, I'm not pointing fingers, but if you only go by what is written, you can't go wrong. <clears throat> so it says, uh, we'll just move on here. It says, regardless of what calendar you keep, this has information on how believers are to keep Passover. And that's the important thing. I'm not trying to tell people what to do. I'm not trying to tell people when to keep things or how. This is trying to say how they do it and why. And it literally goes over what we can read in Scripture. So, Ob willing, you can see this and compare it for yourselves to be confirmed one way or the other in your own minds, right? So it says, this has information on how believers are to keep Passover, which is not like the traditions of men we have today. All right, this is section three on feast days and fast days. A catalog of the feasts of Yahuwah, which are to be kept, and when each of them ought to be observed. This is chapter 13 of section three, book five, for anyone that wants to keep track of that. Brethren, observe the festival days, and first of all, the Chodesh, which you are to celebrate on the first of the first month, which is literally, as we just saw, the first festival that they have. Right here, you have the Chodesh of the first month, the fourth, the seventh, and the tenth, that are the Yamim of Zacharim, or the days of remembrance, if you will, established first by Noah, reinstituted, or reinstituted by Abraham, codified in the Torah of Moshe, and foretold to be perpetual along with the Sabbaths during the millennial reign by Yeshiyahu, where he says that from Chodesh to Chodesh, or from new month to new month, and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come and worship before me. Right. So says, and let this solemnity be observed before the fast of the Passover, beginning from the first day of the week and ending at the day of preparation. So the fast is a whole week long, right? After which solemnities begin the set-apart week of the Passover, fasting in the same, all of you with fear and trembling, praying in them for those that are about to perish. For they began to hold a council against Yahuwah, and this is our Mashiach that they're speaking of. In the translation that we have, it says the Lord in all of these areas. And if you are anywhere familiar with the placeholders or what's called the Nomnia Sacra, the sacred names and the placeholders used in the Greek and the fact that our Mashiach is literally called by the Father's name. This is not a surprise, but this is not the Father being spoken of. I just wanted to be clear. Every time you see Yahuwah being present as a man, that is always our Mashiach, whether it was in the original covenant writings during the times of Abraham and Yitzhak and Yaakov, or where he appeared to them as the messenger over the people in the time of judges, it, it's always our Mashiach who is the Yahuwah that's embodied. Okay? It says, for, the, for they began to hold a council against Yahuwah on the first day of the week, in the first month, which is Abib, and the deliberation continued on the second day of the week. But on the third day, they determined to take away his life by impalement. And that's Matthew Yahu 26, 1 through 5, Mark 14, 1 and 2, and Luke 22, 1 through 6, where you can find the reference to that. Okay. And Yahuda, knowing this, who for a long time had been perverted, but was then smitten by the devil himself with the love of money, although he had been long entrusted with the purse, Yahu Hanan 12, 6, and used to steal what was set apart for the needy. Yet was he not cast off by Yahuwah through much long suffering. Nay, and when we were once feasting with him, being willing both to reduce him to his duty and instruct us in his own foreknowledge, he said, Amen, Amen, I say unto you, that one of you will betray me. 
and every one of us saying, Is it I? That's Yahuchanan 13 or Matit Yahu 26. And Yahuwah being silent, I who was one of the twelve and more beloved by him than the rest. So this would be Eleazar that's speaking, the, the beloved of Yahuwah, or the one whom Yahushua loved all throughout the book of Yahuchanan there, right? He arose up from lying in his bosom and besought him to tell who it should be that should betray him. Yet neither then did our Tov Yahuwah declare his name, but gave two signs of the, of the betrayer. One by saying, He that dips with me in a dish, a second to whom I shall give the sop when I have dipped it. Nay, although, so he gave two witnesses of the fact, two signs for his ta ones to use their mind to reasonably know what was going to happen. But even then, they did not all perceive it at the time. Something to keep in mind, right? The master did not say yes, but said, You have said, and being willing to affright him in the matter, he said, Woe to that man by whom the son of Adam is betrayed. Tov were it for him if he had never been born. Who, when he had heard that, went his way and said to the Kohanim, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they bargained with him for thirty pieces of silver. Matthew Yahu 26.15 And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, and they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Yisrael did value, and gave them for the house of the potter. Matthew Yahu 27, 9 through 10, and Zakar Yahu 11. Whenever you see the brackets like that, it's because I added that verse for the context. It wasn't in the, the notes there. It says, and on the second yom, or day of the week, when we had eaten the supper with him, and when Yahuda had dipped his hand into the dish and received the sop, and had gone out by night, Yahuwah said to us, The hour has come, that you shall be dispersed, and shall leave me alone. Yahukanon 16.32, Matith Yahu 26.31. And every one vehemently affirming that they would not forsake him, I Kepha, adding this promise, that I would even die with him, he said, Amen, I say unto you, before the cock crows, you shall thrice deny that you know me. Luke twenty two thirty four. And when he had delivered to us the representative mysteries of his precious body and blood, Yahuda not being present with us, he went out to the Mount of Olives, near the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, Yahukanon 18.1. And we were with him, and sang an hem with him, or sorry, and sang an hem according to the custom, Matith Yahu 26.30. And being separated not far from us, he prayed to his father, saying, Father, remove this cup away from me, yet not my will but yours be done. So, our Mashiach claims to have his own will, but to be willing and able to do the, the will of the Father. A lot of people will believe that they are one and the same entity in two different persons. Contrary to the plain scriptures, it says Yahuwah is one and not divided. So, and the father does not begat himself to call him his own son. Uh, but that's another thing for a different time. I just wanted to point out that he himself acknowledges he has a separate will of his father, who he also acknowledges in another place to be greater than him. Kepha, in the recognitions of Clement, in the Syriac version that has the missing 10 chapters from the Latin and Greek text on the uh, book three, on the refutation of the Trinity goes into detail that it's an absurd thing to think that someone 
would forget themselves and call themselves their own sons. Yahukanon 17, yes, brother, thank you, where he says that the, the father who has given him his name is greater than all, right? <clears throat> so he says, saying, Father, remove this cup away from me, yet not my will but yours be done. And when he had done this thrice, while we out of despondency of mind were fallen asleep, he came and said, The hour has come. And the son of Adam is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And behold, Yahuda and with him a multitude of unrighteous men. Luke twenty-two forty-seven, Matthew Yahu twenty-six forty-seven, to whom he shows the signal by which he was to betray him, a deceitful kiss, like the kiss you see, uh, the son of Zeruiah, Yahuab the general of the armies of Yahuda and Yisrael during the time of Dawid, where he kills Abner and the other um, man more righteous than he. But one of them he grabs and kisses before doing so with a deceitful kiss. It says, and yet they, when they had received the signal agreed on, took hold of the master and having bound him, they led him to the house of Caiapha, the high Kohen, wherein were assembled many, not the people, but a great rout, and or not an set apart council, but an assembly of the wicked, and council of the unrighteous, who did many things against him, and left no kind of injury untried, spitting upon him, cavelling at him, beating him smiting him on the face, reviling him, tempting him, seeking vain divination instead of true foretellings from him, calling him a deceiver, a blasphemer, a transgressor of Moshe, a destroyer of the temple, a taker away of sacrifices, an enemy to the Romans, an adversary to Caesar. And these reproaches did these bulls and dogs in their madness cast upon him. That's uh, Psalm 22. Till it was very early in the dawn, that would be on the third day of the week, the 14th of the month. And then they led him away to Hanan, who was father-in-law to Caiapha. And when they had done the like things to him there, it being the day of preparation, the day of the preparation, meaning the day before the, the Sabbath, which would have been unleavened bread, that would be what we call a high Sabbath, not a weekly Sabbath, right? It says, they delivered him to Pilate or Pilatus, the Roman governor, accusing him of many and great things, none of which they could prove. Whereupon the governor, as out of patience with them, said, I find no cause against him. Luke 23, 14, Yahuchanan 18, 38. But they bringing two lying witnesses, desiring to accuse the master falsely, but they being found to disagree, and so their testimony not conspiring together. They altered the accusation to that of treason. So you see, the Torah says that when men get caught being a false witness, they're to face the, the punishment that they were trying to get the innocent man convicted of. So in right ruling, those men should have been condemned, but instead they alter the accusation and force the, the condemnation on the innocent one, thus sealing their own fate, because they do to another what they have done to them. Just... So we can see that he's true and righteous in his words, the reason why certain things have to happen, okay? It says, they altered it to trees and saying, this fellow says that he is a king and forbids to give tribute to Caesar. Luke 23, 2. And they themselves became accusers, satanic, and witnesses, that's false witnesses, and judges, unrighteous judges, and authors of the sentence saying, Impale him, impale him. Luke 23, 21. 
that it might be fulfilled, which is written by the foretellers concerning him. Unrighteous witnesses have gathered or were gathered together against me, and unrighteousness lied to itself. And again, many dogs compassed about me, the assembly of the wicked laid siege against me, and elsewhere, my inheritance became to me as a lion in the wood, and has sent forth her voice against me. Yirmiyahu 12.8 Pilatus, therefore, dishonoring his authority by his possibility or cowardliness, convicts himself of wickedness by regarding the multitude more than this righteous man, and bearing witness to him that he was innocent, yet as guilty, delivering him up to the punishment of the stake, or impalement, what we call crucifixion, right? although the Romans had made laws that no man unconvicted should be put to death. But the executioners took Yahuwah of esteem. And it actually says the Lord of esteem right here, which is why I'm fairly certain it meant Yahuwah in those places, because he's literally called Yahuwah of esteem on Mount Sinai and in a few other places. That's, that's one of the titles for our Mashiach. He's the one that is esteemed because he's the one that's visible. And he was given the place at the right hand of the Father for what he did. This is, but the executioners took Yahuwah of esteem and nailed him to the stake, impelling him indeed at the sixth hour, but having received the sentence of his condemnation at the third hour. After this, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. Then they divided his garments by lot. Then they impaled two malefactors with him on each side one, that it might be fulfilled which was written. They gave me gall to eat, and when I was thirsty they gave me vinegar to drink. And again they divided my garment among themselves, and upon my vesture have they cast lots. And in another place I was reckoned with the transgressors. Yes, Yahoo 53, 12. The other one, again, this is Psalm 22. He's quoted it quite a few times in the last few moments there. And then the gall and vinegar, a lot of people point out where that's mentioned, but the contrast, that you, just so you know, Proverbs says that if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. So you provide for those, even if they're your enemy, you give the necessities of life. Okay? And here, the one who is nothing but their benefit and friend, the one who's closer than a brother, they treat such disrespectful manner. And this is true to everyone who sins. Then there was darkness for three hours, from the sixth to the ninth, and again light in the evening, as it is written, it shall not be day or night, and at evening there shall be light. All which things, when those malefactors saw that it was, or that were impaled with him, the one of them reproached him as though he were weak and unable to deliver himself, like it mentions in Chokmah Shalomo chapters 1 and 2 there, or 2 and 3, right? But the other rebuked the ignorance of his fellow, <clears throat> and turning to Yahuwah as being enlightened by him and acknowledging who he was that suffered, he prayed <clears throat> that he would remember him in his kingdom hereafter. He, Yahushua, then presently granted him the forgiveness of his former sins. But notice the man still died. He was forgiven but he had to suffer the consequences of his choices without complaining, walking in love just like everyone else after witnessing to the truth and confessing and forsaking what you do wrong. Same pattern. And then he was given a more perfect immersion in his death with him, as it mentions elsewhere in the Apostolic Constitutions. It says, then presently, or he then presently granted him the forgiveness of his former sins and brought him into paradise, to enjoy the mystical toe things, who also cried out about the ninth hour and said to his father, Eli, Eli, why have you forsaken me? 
And a little afterward, when he had cried with a loud voice, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and had added, Into your hands I commit my Ruach, he gave up the Ruach and was buried before sunset, before sunset on the 14th. It mentions a lot of people don't get that, but that's when it was before the sunset on the 14th, he was already buried. And that is because it mentions, I believe it's in Deuteronomy, on those that are cursed that are hung from a tree, you do not leave to remain past the day. They're to be buried before sunset. It was the law. Just like they observed the law of the Pesach, and it was followed to the letter in his life, so was the law of the woes cursed by the hanging from a tree so that we can know these things reasonably with multiple witnesses. That's why it was given, right? It says, and he was buried before sunset in a new sepulcher, but when the Shabbat dawned, he arose from the dead and fulfilled those things which before his passion he foretold to us, saying the son of Adam must continue in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And when he was risen from the dead, he appeared first to Miriam Magdala, and Miriam the mother of Jacob. So the Miriams that appeared, they appeared to him first. Um, <clears throat> they were they saw he was missing. They did not know what had happened. They went and got the told the other ones someone stole them, and Kepha and, and Elazar or Yahukanan rushed to go discover the tomb. And it's empty, and they believe that his he'd been taken. And then while Miriam is there, after they leave, she's still crying. The messengers appear, saying, why do you cry? And then our Mishyak appeared to her, and she calls him Rabboni, and he says, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father. Then in the evening on that Shabbat, he appears to the eleven. And he, they see him, but they don't touch him, and they tell Toma, or Thomas, the twin, of which he says, unless I put my hands on him and, you know, finger those holes and fill it myself, I will not believe it. So after eight days, right? Oh, this, this is the thing. Just so you can see it here. They contend with him in the night. They take him. They mistreat him, abuse him, bring him before Pilate. They do all those things during the day. He's killed and buried before sunset one two three risen they came to the tomb before sunrise they thought he was kidnapped the, the taught ones came during that time in the evening Calaf right his uncle and another going on the way from one place to another a sabbath day's journey but 60 stradion away from Yarushalayim, so way further than a Sabbath day's journey there, he appears and walks with them. And when the evenings come, they stop at that town, and then he discloses who they are, who he is to them. Then they run back to Yarushalayim to tell everybody. But that's after sunset on this Sabbath, right? So then it says, after eight days, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. After this day in the evening, when all 12 are together, he appears and allows Toma to touch him. The absolute earliest that that can happen, first fruits, after he's ascended to the Father during that day. And that perfectly fits this calendar. That perfectly fits the account right from Yahukanon. And the other accounts follow right in with it when you actually translate some of the words correctly, like before instead of first and one of the Sabbaths instead of first day of the week, right? There's a few other hiccups there, but that's really the gist of it. All the accounts line up, including this one. This is then to Caiaphas in the way, and after that to us his taught ones who had fled away for fear of the Yahudim, but privately were very inquisitive about him. But these things are also written in the Tov News. He, therefore, and this is the gist of it, here's what we're enjoined to do and why, okay? So it says, he, therefore, charged us 
himself to fast these six yamim, or these six days, on account of the impiety and transgression of the Yahudim. Matthew Yahu 9.15, Luke 5.34-35, and Mark 2.19. Okay? Covers what he's talking about. Commanding us withal to bewail over them and lament for their perdition. Like when he saw Yarushalayim, and he wept over it. For even he himself wept over them, because they knew not the time of their visitation. That's what he said in the book of Luke, when he saw Yarushalayim, and he wept, because they knew not the time of the visitation. And if you recall, the word for pakad, pay, uh, kof dalit, and then pakada is the word for like the judges or the overseers of the synagogues, and then also the visitation. And it was the judges or the overseers of synagogues, the, the enlighteners or the, the teachers of men that were supposed to share with them about the time of his visitation and what it was going to be like. There's a scroll we've gone over beforehand, but it's called the Two Ruach Oath, or it's part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I believe it's in the community rule, but it talks about the two spirits or the two Ruach Oath, the Ruach of Yahuwah or the Ruach of Melchizedek, also known as, as um, the Prince of Light, right? Or the King of Righteousness and the Ruach or the spirit of Malkirasha, or that's the King of Evil or the Prince of Darkness. And it goes into detail about the manifestations of these Ruachs, what they are like, and what character traits that they manifest. So people who are of that Ruach will be manifesting those character traits. And then it further goes into detail about what will happen to that person that has that Ruach in them at the times of the visitation both when our Mashiach came the first time and what it's going to be like when he returns. So you really don't want to have the adversarial Ruach in you because you will have the same thing happen to you that happened to the Yahudim that rejected the truth. And we all know what happened there. They were utterly destroyed by Rome, made subservient to him, to them, and had all the curses of the covenant come upon them for rejecting the truth. But I highly recommend going over that and really looking at what it means. And then if you see what Ruach is in you and the manifestations of what happens during his visitation, then read the accounts of the Besora and what he literally did with people. And you can see, oh, they had that Ruach, they had that one. They had his, they had the Satans. Very easy to identify. It says, but he commanded us to fast on the fourth and sixth days of the week. So right here, he charged us to fast the entire Pesach week, like I was mentioning to you, right here, all week, right here, these six days. But you fast until evening, and you have a small meal like they did, okay? They did that all the way up to here, and then they fast completely when he was dead, as we'll, we're about to read, and then you break your fast on the Shabbat. You would keep unleavened bread for the remainder of the time that you would be doing that, as he, he mentions here. But I just wanted to show you again there. All right, so here, real quick. Sorry for that. There it goes. It says, he therefore charges himself to fast these six days on account of the impiety and transgression of the Yahudim. All right, and then he, but he says he commands us to fast on the fourth and sixth days of the week, every other time of the year. That's what I was trying to mention. Sorry, on the regular parts of the year when it's not a festival day, he enjoins, and this is for all believers. If you remember when Legion was there and he couldn't be, or, sorry, not Legion, but when the man who had a child that would toss himself into the fire and water and the the taught ones could not cast him out our mashiach had mentioned to them that some can only become 
cast out with fasting and prayer. It goes into more detail about how to fast in the Shepherd of Her Mass, but the long story short, when as a believer, if you fast on the fourth day of the week and the sixth day of the week, and you take what you would use for yourself and you give that to the poor, the widow, the fatherless, that isn't, and you're not doing anything evil, you're not sinning, that is an acceptable fast to him and approved by him. And then you'll be doing that fast where you're always able to cast out demons through prayer because you're continually fasting. It's not every single day, but is a consistent pattern. Some people do more. Kepha completely abstained from desirable meats and foods. He fasted all the time and lived off herbs and bread so that he could have power over all demons. He had no pleasures in the things of this world because he was looking for the future. That was his choice, and we all get the measure of what we choose to do according to our belief. So it says, the former on account of his being betrayed, all right, and the latter on account of his passion, but he appointed us to break our fast on the seventh day at cock crowing. That's after the seven or the six days of fasting, right? But to fast on the Sabbath day, and this is where it's confusing, okay? I really don't mean to be, but they tampered with the text because they wanted to try to say that you have your, our Mashiach died and was buried here. He was buried on the Sabbath day and he rose right here. That's what they try to say. They want, if at all possible, they want men to literally mourn and afflict themselves on the day he was resurrected. And that's why it's adjusted to that calendar in that very fashion quite twisted exactly opposite of what it should be but that's the that's what satan does kills steals and destroys so the point is you keep oops, i'm sorry this fast or this sabbath is the one where he's literally buried in the ground where the bridegroom was taken away and this is the one the 15th of the third month or first month that you're supposed to fast. This is the only Shabbat that they say you're fasting on. Although for those of you that are still like me, not perfect, we have the day of atonement that we have to afflict our beings on as well. But right here, we die with him. We afflict our beings when the bridegroom is taken away. That's when you fast, right? And this whole week he's afflicted. But this one, these three, as you'll see, is what they're talking about when it says you abstain on that Sabbath day. It says, not that the Sabbath day is a day of fasting, being the rest from the creation, but because we ought to fast on this one Sabbath only, while on this day the Creator was under the earth, or in the earth. For on their very feast day, they apprehended Yahuwah. That oracle, or that the oracle might be fulfilled, which says, they placed their signs in the middle of their feasts and knew them not. You ought therefore to be well over them, because when Yahuwah came, they did not believe in him, but rejected his doctrine, judging themselves unworthy of deliverance. You therefore are happy, or ashray, prosperous, right? Who once were not a people, but are now unset apart nation. Delivered, or a set-apart nation, delivered from the deceit of idols, from ignorance, from impiety, who once had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy through your hearty obedience. For to you, the converted nations, is the opened the gate of life, who formerly were not beloved, but are now beloved. A people ordained for a possession, or sorry, for the possession of Elohim, to show forth his virtues, concerning whom our deliverer said, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest to them that asked not after me. I said, Behold me to a nation which did not call upon my name. For when you did not seek after him, then you were sought for by him, and you who have believed in him have hearkened to his call, 
and have left the madness of polytheism and have fled to the true monarchy, to El Shaddai, through Mashiach Yahushua, and have become the completion of the number of the delivered, ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, Daniel 7.10, which would be Ephraim and Manasseh, the, the ten thousands of ten thousands and the thousands of thousands, as alluded to elsewhere, or Britain's Commonwealth and America. As it is written in Dawid, a thousand shall fall beside you, and ten thousand at your right hand. And again, the chariots of El are by tens of thousands, and thousands of the prosperous. But unto unbelieving Yisrael, he says, All day long I have stretched out mine hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people, like when he was impaled, right? All day long. He stretched out his hands to a gainsaying, disobedient people, which go in a way that is not tov, but after their own sins, a people provoking me before my face. Yes, Yahu 65 2. See how the people provoked Yahuwah by not believing in him. Therefore, he says they provoked the, the Kodesh Ruach. And he was turned to be their enemy. Yeshiyahu 63.10 For blindness is cast upon them by reason of the wickedness of their mind. Willing thoughts that are contrary to what he said to do. Okay? Because when they saw Yahushua, they did not believe him to be the Mashiach of El who was before all ages begotten of him, his only begotten son, El the Word, whom they did not own through their unbelief, neither on account of his mighty works, nor yet on account of the foretellings which were written concerning him. For that he was to be born of a virgin, not a maiden, but literally Bethula, they read, and that was tampered with in the Masoretic text, part of that. If you know he's the truth, then he is like the living Torah, where the physical one is a representation of his earthly body. What they did to the truth of his words is the same as they're reviling and spitting and mistreating his body before handing him over to Pilate for the Romans to completely make him unrecognizable as a man which is reminiscent of what they would do to the word, right? One of the things there is changing stuff to make it so we wouldn't believe what is true. It says, but that he was to be born of a virgin, they read this foretelling. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, for, which means L with us, right? For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, whose government is upon his shoulders, and his name is called the messenger of his great counsel, the wonderful counselor, the mighty El, the king, the prince of peace, the father of the future age. Some of them, like the Masoretic texts, will put the father of continuity, and they, or the everlasting father trying to make that claim that he is his own father again, but that is not true. The word there is of the future age, and there's a whole thing that you can get into with that. But our Mashiach is the one who's laboring over the children now to bring forth the, the people for his own possession, and that is the people he is like a father over, but he is not the father. So... This distinction has also gone over by Shaul and in other places too. And you can even find where he's called a father or like a father over the people while he is not the father, even in the original covenant writings. A lot of this stuff is plainly said by foretellers in the original texts, and it's just looked over quite often if you're not paying attention. But the distinction between the father and his son and the Ruach is all throughout there as well. 
says, now that because of their exceeding great wickedness, they would not believe in him, Yahuwah shows in these words, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of Yahuwah been revealed? And afterward, hearing you shall hear and shall not comprehend, and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive, for the heart of this people has grown gross. Wherefore knowledge has or was taken away, because seeing they overlooked, and hearing they heard not, but to you the converted of the nations is the Malkuth given, because you, who knew not Elohim, have believed by preaching, and have known him, or rather are known of him, through Yahushua, the deliverer and redeemer of those that expect in him. For you are translated from your former vain and tedious mode of life, and have condemned the lifeless idols, and despised the demons which are in darkness, and have run to the true light, Yahuchanan 1 9, and by it, or by him, have known the one and only true El and Father, Yahuchanan 17 3, and so are owned to be heirs of his kingdom. For since you have been immersed into Yahuwah's death, Romans 6 3, and into his resurrection, as newborn babes, first Kepha 2.2, 2, you ought to be wholly or completely free from all sinful actions. And this is where after you're immersed, that evil inclination is removed from you. And unless you intentionally do evil, it will never, never offend you again. Okay? Another witness for this is in the Shepherd of Hermas, Book 2, Fourth Command. For you are not your own, but his that bought you, 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20, with his own blood. For concerning the former Yisrael, Yahuwah speaks thus on account of their unbelief. The kingdom of Elohim, and this is concerning the, the Yahudim, not Yisrael. Yisrael was the northern kingdom in captivity to which Yahushua alone was sent to the lost sheep to which he sent his taught ones. And we, we've covered this before, but in the apostolic constitutions, it gives you a list of where the taught ones went. Other places have it enumerated too, where they died, what they taught. And they went to the children in Asia Minor, or what we call Turkey, Pontus, Galatia, Lithuania, all around the Caspian and Black Seas, right? The Sarmatians, the Bracteans, the Scythians, the Germans, all mentioned as who the taught ones went to. And these are all literally the lost tribes, the lost sheep. They were the ones that were... Uh, Yisrael, and the, the former ones that were rejected here are Yahuda. So just for context, Yahuda rejected him there when he came. He sent the good news out, and then it was received or rejected by the people as, you know, they, they, they got it. But based on whether they conformed and became a light to the nations or did not, that's what predicated what came next. And because the people by and large, rejected the truth. They went into the belly of the beast. They were uh, afflicted, fought off, persecuted or whatever, and ran off from the areas they were off into Europe and into the Roman Empire there as those Germanic hordes that broke apart the pagan Rome, broke it into ten kingdoms, and then subsequently three of them were plucked up at the rising of the little horn to power which is the Bishop of Rome. This is all historical fact that was foretold, and that was also the sign of Yonah that was given to the, the wicked. So while there was a remnant of the people that stayed true, and those were the people that were martyrs during the Dark Ages and afflicted during those times, by and large, his, his children cast away the truth, and then they got what they had coming. But just for context again, this should say Yahuda. 
says, The kingdom of Elohim shall be taken from them and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And that happened at the Reformation when they finally repented and started bringing forth the fruits of it. And that was the time when he's leading the blind in the way. They were blind because they, we didn't have his name. We didn't keep the feast. We didn't have all the truth, but they were doing the right ruling. They were doing the righteousness and it was approved by him for those things. But we're at a time now where we should know better. We grow past those things. And the reason why we haven't, or rather the fact that we are keeping things that are unprofitable is the reason why we have the bull judgments from Revelation, the saucer judgments literally being poured out on our country and the world. That's for another time. However, these things can be known, and it's only ignorance that's keeping us from it at this point, which is why it's important to learn it. Oh, it looks like I have to find our spot again. Sorry about that. Here we go. So it says, that is to say that having given the kingdom to you who were once far estranged from him, he expects the fruits of your gratitude and probity. For you are those that were once sent into the vineyard and did not obey. But these that did obey, but you have repented of your denial and you work therein now, meaning the northern kingdom, right? But they being uneasy on account of their own covenants have not only left the vineyard uncultivated, but have also killed the stewards of the master of the vineyard, one with stones, another with the sword, one they sawed asunder, another they slew in the set-apart place between the temple and the altar, which was Zakar Yahu, Yahu Kanan's father, right? Nay, the last they cast, or at last they cast the heir himself out of the vineyard and slew him. And by them he was rejected as an unprofitable stone, Matthew 21, 42. But by you was received as the cornerstone. Wherefore he says concerning you, a people whom I knew not have served me, and at the hearing of the ear have they obeyed me. It is therefore your duty, brethren, who are redeemed by the precious blood of Mashiach, to observe the days of the Pesach exactly with all care after the vernal equinox. Now, that's the word they use right here. That's all we have in the English. But we know that to be after the sign of the equal light and darkness of the 31st day of the 12th month, which leads to the first day of the year, as enumerated in the book of Hanok, chapter 72, I believe 84 as well. But um, they call this a vernal equinox something today that does not line up with our creator's calendar. Men try to follow it, and they get a lot of confusion because of that. I don't know enough about it to make a comment other than it does not stay on a day that it's supposed to in regard to his calendar. So for whatever that is. And just so you know, Anyone can put a stick in the ground or put a thing, set up a sundial to have it point to the same day on the same or the same place every year. Depending on how you do it, it can change. So if you don't have the rules or the instructions for how to set that up properly, which there is absolutely none in any of the Dead Sea Scrolls or anywhere that I know to be written. Um, there is no instructions for how to do that legitimately. It says, yeah. The the book of Hanok has to do with it, 18 parts light and darkness it goes through. And you can talk about 24-hour periods and however you want to compute the math. It is possible to do that. We've talked about it before, but that's kind of a for a different thing here. Point being, they want you to do it after the beginning of the year in springtime where you keep it only once a year. Right, At least you'd be obliged to keep the memorial of the one passion twice in a year. Keep it once only in a year for him that died but once. It says, do not you yourselves compute, but keep it when your brethren of the circumcision do so. So the believers who are of the circumcision, not the Gentiles that were coming to the belief. 
because they knew the calendar, right? Keep it together with them, and if they err in their computation, be not you concerned. Um, I'm not going to comment on that because we don't have any other witnesses that, that tell you to do that kind of thing. It says, keep your nights of watching in the middle of the days of unleavened bread, where you, they'd stay up and try to keep their watch, right? They want you to do it during unleavened bread while you're fasting, if able. It says, and when the Yahudim are feasting, do you fast and wail over them? Because on the day of their feast, they staked Mashiach. And while they are lamenting and eating unleavened bread in bitterness, do you feast, but no longer be, and that means after the resurrection, right? You don't, you're not, you feast, you enjoy yourself in the feast. You don't do it with lamentation because he's risen, right? It says, but no longer be careful, okay? But no longer be careful to keep the feast with the Yahudim. And I put unbelieving here because again, you're supposed to keep it with your brethren of the circumcision that do so, who are believers, right? For we have now no communion with them, for they have been led astray in regard to the calculation itself. So this is written after our Mashiach came, and now they're enjoined not to keep it because they're led astray. But there was no condemnation beforehand in any capacity in any of the good news accounts on them keeping a separate calendar, which is another thing that is an issue today. It says, which they think that they accomplish perfectly, that they may be led astray on every hand and be fenced off, or Gadar, that God real, right? And be fenced off from the truth. But do you observe carefully the vernal equinox, or the beginning, the last, right, the sign right before the beginning of the year, equal parts light and darkness, which occurs on the 31st of the 12th month, observing carefully until the 21st of the month, least the 14th of the month shall fall on another week, and an error being committed, you should through ignorance celebrate the Passover twice in the year, or celebrate the day of resurrection of our Yahuwah on any other day than a Shabbat specifically the 18th of the first month, always the seventh day of the week. It says, You should therefore fast on the days of the Passover beginning from the first day of the week until the preparation and the Sabbath. I put in brackets, this would be the first of unleavened bread, a high, not a weekly Shabbat, right? Six days, making use of bread only, and salt, and herbs, and water for your drink. So you abstain from desirable foods, and you just live on the necessity there. Okay? Water, bread, salt, herbs. Really, the, the, you need the protein, the fiber, and the minerals are necessities for life, along with water. So... You have the bare necessities and you fast, right? It says, but do you abstain on these days from wine and flesh? For they are days of lamentation and not of feasting. You who are able should fast the day of the preparation and the Sabbath day entirely. Okay, so if you're able, it's saying fast this one and this one entirely this whole week with bread and herbs and water and salt but these two entirely because that's what they walked out okay so it actually lines up exactly with the accounts that you can read there if you pay attention says, but do you abstain on these days from wine and flesh, for they are the days of lamentation and not of feasting. You who are able should fast on the day of preparation and on the Sabbath day entirely not, or tasting nothing till the cock crowing of the night. But if anyone is not able to join them both together, 
at least let him observe the Sabbath day. For Yahuwah says somewhere, speaking of himself, when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, in those days shall they fast. In these days, therefore, he was taken away from us by the Yahudim, falsely so named, and fastened to the tree, and was numbered among the transgressors. Yes, Yahu 52.12 Wherefore, we exhort you to fast on those days, as we also fasted till evening, or till the evening, when he was taken away from us, but on the rest of the days, before the day of preparation, or the preparation, let everyone eat at the ninth hour, or at the evening, or as everyone is able. But from the evening of the fifth till cock crowing, break your fast when it is daybreak of one of the Shabbats, which is Yahuwah's day. So, one of the Sabbaths, the one that he resurrected on, right? And that is that word that's used literally in the Good News accounts where it's translated first day of the week, but it's, it should be one of the Sabbaths. So right here, you have water, bread, and herbs in the evening, in the evening, completely abstain if able, completely abstain, period, in the evening, in the evening, break your fast and dawn. A desirable meal, whatever you want. That's a lot easier than I, how I kept it last time because I literally, I would do the half thing and I completely fasted these three days, which was very hard, but um, not impossible. So to continue, and I don't advocate doing things contrary to what's written. So I actually did that wrong which I will correct now, but just so you know, I'm not perfect either, right? <clears throat> it says, from the evening till cock crowing, keep awake and assemble together in the assembly, watch and pray and entreat Elohim, reading, when you sit up all night, the law, the foretellers, and the Psalms, until cock crowing, and immersing your instructed, and reading the Tove news with fear and trembling, and speaking to the people such things as tend to their deliverance, put an end to your sorrow and beseech Elohim that Yisrael may be converted, and that he will allow them to a place or allow them place of repentance and the remission of their impiety. For the judge who was a stranger, Pontius Pilatus, right, washed his hands and said, I am innocent of the blood of this righteous man, see to it. But Yisrael, or Yahuda cried out, His blood be on us and on our children. Matith Yahu 27, 24 through 25. It says Yisrael there, but that is, they were not partakers of that. That was Yahuda. So we want to be accurate in what we have, okay? And when Pilatus said, Shall I impel your king? They cried out, We have no king but Caesar. Impale him, impale him. For every one that makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. And if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. And Pilatus the governor and Herod the king commanded him to be staked. And that oracle was fulfilled, which says, Why did the nations rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against Yahuwah and against his Mashiach. And they cast away the beloved as a dead man who is abominable. Yeshiyahu 14, 19. And since he was impaled on the yom of the preparation, I had added Passover prep for the first of unleavened bread, and rose again at break of day on Yahuwah's yom, the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Arise, Elohim, judge the earth, for you shall have an inheritance in all the nations. And again, and 
this is you shall have an inheritance in all the nations it doesn't mean every single nation every single p all as in the totality of them but he will have a presence or a people from every nation so quantity or not quality not quantity but quality right or not um qualitative but quantitative there we go i'm sorry about that not saying all of them period but that of all of them some from them in the same way that he uses the root of all evil for money it's not literally all evil but all kinds of evil can stem from money not literally every evil though so there, there's a context in these uses of all that we have to be very mindful of. It's almost always misappropriated by um, translators, most particularly in the book of Revelation. It says, I will arise, says Yahuwah. I will put him in safety. I will wax bold through him. And But you, Yahuwah, have mercy upon me and raise me up again and I shall requit them. For this reason, you should also, now that Yahuwah is risen, offer your offering, concerning which he made a constitution by us, saying, do this for a remembrance of me, and thenceforward or thenceward, leave off your fasting and rejoice and keep a festival, meaning from the Shabbat on for the rest of it, right? Because Yahushua Mashiach, the pledge of our resurrection is risen from the dead. And let this be an everlasting ordinance till the consummation of the world, until Yahuwah comes. So this is meant to be kept in the way that is taught one's enjoying here until he returns, which is why I think it's important that we actually know what it is, check for ourselves, and then conform if, if and when we become convinced of it, right? It says for to Yahuda, or sorry, for to Yahua, or sorry, my apologies, for to the Yahudim, Yahua is still dead, but to the Nazarim he is risen, to the former by their unbelief, to the latter by their full assurance of belief. For the expectation in him is immortal and eternal life. After eight days. Let there be another feast observed with honor. This is first fruits. The eighth day itself, on which he gave me Thomas, who was hard of belief, full assurance, by showing me the print of the nails and the wound made in his side by the spear. Yahukanon 20, 25. So again, another witness that eight days from this Sabbath that he rose, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That was first fruits. And in the evening of that, as mentioned in Yahukin on there, was when he appeared and allowed Tom, Toma to touch him. Because then he had ascended to his father during that day, and he was now able, to which was the only condition confessed by the mouth of Toma, on which he would believe. So, conforms perfectly with the calendar does not fit when you say there's multiple calendars or a whole bunch of other contrivances that are literally not written anywhere. This is, and again, from the first Yahuwah's day, count 40 days from Yahuwah's day till the fifth day of the week, and I put in brackets the fifth of the third month, and celebrate the feast of the ascension of Yahuwah whereon he finished all his dispensation and constitution when he had finished giving them the apostolic constitutions, literally the, the constitution for his kingdom, and returned to that El and Father that sent him and sat down at the right hand of power and remains there until his enemies are put under his feet. He will not return in enmity. Okay who also will come at the consummation of the world with power and great esteem to judge the quick and the dead and to recompense to every man according to his works. And then shall they see the beloved son of El, whom they pierced. Zechariah 12.10, Yahukanon 19.37, 
And when they know him, they shall mourn for themselves, tribe by tribe, and their wives apart. And that's also in the foretellers there. But right here, from first fruits till the fifth day of the third month, right here, which is the fifth day of the week, is 40 days. You've got seven, okay? You got... Uh, what is that, 22 or uh, 28? That's 35, then 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. So the 40th day, fifth day of the week, which is the fifth of the third month, and 10 days before Shavuot, just like we have in Scripture, okay? Which was when he was, or his body was born again. So we'll just finish this up real quick. It says, who will come at the consummation of the world with power and greed? See, we read that part, sorry. It says, for even now, on the tenth day of the seventh month, when they assemble together, they read the lamentations of Yahu, in which it is said, the Ruach before our face, Mashiach Yahuwah, was taken in their destructions. Lamentations 4.20. This is one of a few places that say Mashiach Yahuwah, speaking of our Mashiach and calling him Yahuwah, just so you know. And Baruch, in whom it is written, this is our El, no other shall be esteemed with him. He found out every way of knowledge and showed it to Yaakob, his son, meaning he's the father of the one he's laboring over. And this is our Mashiach that's speaking, as we'll see here. And Yisrael, his beloved, afterwards he was seen upon earth and conversed with men. Baruch 3, 35 through 37. The Father is seen by no one. Right? We've only heard our Mashiach speaking the words of the Father and messengers sent by them. Okay? And when they read them, they lament and bewail as themselves suppose that desolation which happened by Nebuchadnezzar. But as the truth shows, they unwillingly make a prelude to that lamentation which will overtake them. Meaning this constitution was given before the destruction of Yerushalayim in 70 AD. Okay. Which is fitting because Kepha and Shaul were martyrs in the 60s. Yet after 10 days, when from the ascension, which from the first fruits is the 50th day, keep a great festival. For on that day, at the third hour, Yahuwah Yahushua sent on us the gift of the Kodesh Ruach. And we were filled with his energy, and we spoke with new tongues as that Ruach did suggest to us. Acts 2.4 And we preached both to Yahudi and Gentiles, that he is the Mashiach of El, who is determined by him to be the judge of the quick and dead. Maase or Acts 10.42 To him did Moshe bear witness and said, Yahuwah received fire from Yahuwah and rained it down. Meaning, the son received fire from the father and rained it down. Genesis 19.24 Another witness on this being explained in that very fashion is in Irenaeus or Irenaeus's writing against heresies, where it's quoted and gone into detail. Him did Jacob see as a man and said, I have seen El face to face and my inner being is preserved. Genesis 32, 20. Him did Abraham entertain, meaning he washed his feet he fed him, if you recall, him and two messengers before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah as foretelling that Elohim would appear amongst men as a man, converse with them, eat and dine with them, and showing these things to Abraham as a foreteller, to which it would also be shown that the father who is also called Yahuwah would give all authority and judgment to his son called Yahuwah, who would appear on earth to administer it. And all of that shown in the original covenant writings that most people completely have no idea about because we're not taught these things correctly. 
But it says, him did Abraham entertain and acknowledge to be the judge and his Yahuwah. Genesis 18, 1 through 33. Him did Moshe see in the bush. Concerning him did he speak in Deuteronomy. And it was in Deuteronomy because it's literally in Exodus chapter 20. It, the missing part of it is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But our Mashiach himself spoke from his own mouth on Mount Sinai that a foreteller would come like unto Moshe in all things, and him they would listen to, because they asked not to hear his voice there anymore, at least they die. Okay? So this is a foreteller will Yahuwah, your Elohim, raise up unto you out of your brethren, like me, like Moshe, him shall you hear in all things, whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall be that every inner being that will not hear that foreteller shall be destroyed from among his people. Deuteronomy 18.15 Him did Yahushua the son of Nun see as the prince of Yahuwah's hosts in armor for their assistance against Yericho, to whom he fell down and worshipped as a servant does his master. Yahushua 514. The one in the burning bush who was Yahuwah, the Elohim of the Yahu of uh, the Hebrews, right? The Yahuwah who delivered them that appeared on Mount Sinai is our Mashiach, and he is the one that appeared as the captain of Yahuwah's hosts in armor that was worshipped by Yahushua the son of Nun. Just as he was worshipped by the lepers and by other men and by every messenger and by every knee that will bow to him, the sun will be worshipped, just for those people that say that's not, not a thing, right? This is, uh, and, and he plainly says that he who values the sun is valued by the Father, right? In this, you have to value the sun as you value the Father. And the sun was made Elohim by the will of his Father. So there's another witness for that. Him Shemuel knew as the Mashiach of El, 1 Samuel 12, 3, and thence named the Kohanim and kings HaMashiach. So it was because Shemuel knew him to be the Mashiach that he called Kohanim and kings Mashiach after anointing them. Him Dawid knew and sung a hymn concerning him, a song concerning the Beloved. Now, if you look in the Septuagint version, in some translations like the Hallelujah Scriptures, it'll say a song by David. And here it's telling you that whenever it says that, La Dawid, it's literally saying concerning the beloved. And it, every one of these, I challenge you to find one that isn't. Go to every psalm that mentions it's by David and read it as if it is the first hand personal words right out of the mouth of our Mashiach. And you'll be amazed at how accurate that is about what he's doing. So that's the secret. And it's right here where he tells you that. And him Dawid knew and sung an hem concerning him, a song concerning the beloved. And adds in his person, as in speaking for him. And he says, gird your sword upon your thigh, you who are mighty in your beauty and renown. Go on and prosper and reign for the sake of truth and meekness and righteousness. And your right hand shall guide you after a wonderful, after a paleo manner. Your darts are sharpened, you that are mighty. The people shall fall under you in the heart of the king's enemies. Wherefore, Elohim, your Elohim, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. Psalm 45. Concerning him also spoke Shalomo, as in his person, like from his mouth himself, from the, the gift of the Ruach, right? The Ruach spoke as if speaking from our Mashiach through the mouth of Shalomo. And he said, Yahuwah created me the beginning of his ways. For his works, before the world he founded me, in the beginning before he made the earth, before the fountains of waters came, before the mountains were fastened, 
he begot me before all the hills. Proverbs 8, 22 through 25. And again, Hokmah built herself a house, meaning our Mashiach built a house for himself. Hokmah as a her, we learn elsewhere, is enumerated as the Ruach, meaning it's not the son or the firstborn, but literally only says what it hears from our Mashiach and does not speak of herself, right? These things he directly tells them. The only hiccup we have is in the renewed covenant writings. It says he or the Ruach when all throughout the original covenant, all throughout the what they call the um, apocryphal writings, the Ruach or the spirit is given the manifestation of a she or wisdom, right, is a she. And that is because it's explained by Kepha. The Ruach is not the firstborn nor the begotten son of Elohim. So that's just the, the capacity in which it came. I don't want to go into too much more detail beyond that because it's not the point here. It says, concerning him also, Yeshayahu said, the branch shall come out of the root of Yeshai or Jesse, which is he is my gift. All right, Yeshai, he is my gift. Right? And a flower shall spring out of his root and there shall be a root of Yeshai. He is the root and the offspring, right? And he that is to rise to, to reign over the nations, in him shall the nations trust. Yeshayahu 11, 1 and 10. And Zechariahu says, Behold, your king comes unto you, righteous and having deliverance, meek and riding upon a donkey, and upon a colt, the fowl, of a donkey. So upon the colt and the donkey, he rode on both, if you remember. And we, we've talked about that before, but because the truth came in with the first covenant and then after the return, so it was not just with the mother, Yarushalayim, but the daughter after the captivity, it was on the colt and then what was born of it. Both of them donkeys like the wild donkey man Yishmael, who is he who will hear, believe, and do, right, the things of El. But they were stubborn and without bit and bridle would not come near, right? That the picture of those first covenant believers at that time. And it's not just the Yahudim, it's all, all 12 tribes, right? The first covenant believers rejected and would not go unless they were steered and whipped. We're, we're not supposed to continue in that way, right? This is in that Zakar Yahu 9 9. Sorry. Him Daniel describes as the son of Adam coming to the Father and receiving all judgment and honor from him. Daniel 7 13. And as the stone cut out of the mountain without hands and becoming a great mountain and filling the whole earth and dashing to pieces the many governments of the smaller countries and the polytheism of mighty ones, but preaching the one L. Now, it rises up in the ring. We'll go over this in more detail another time too, but this kingdom, the stone cut out of the mountain without hands and becoming a great mountain, happens during the time of the fourth beast while the other kingdoms are still there. And it was during the Roman Empire that our Mashiach came and brought this good news. The good news is synonymous with what we would call the common law. And I know that seems so weird to some people, that the literal governments of Britain and America are, are the scriptures. But that's just a testament to how far we've been deluded and confused by Satan and how much our history is really mucked up. But... You can trace it all the way back to these times and before that the common law is the Torah. It, it can be traced back to Great Britain all the way back to 510 BC and the codified law of Malmontis, the, the Celtic king of Britain at that time. That very law was translated into Latin and was later translated back into what we call English by Alfred the Great and codified as his dooms or judgments, which is the common law of England and America even to this day. 
So none of that is hidden, although it's intentionally not taught, but it's freely available for anyone to look into, at least it is currently. And it is the common law, the governments of America and Britain and Australia and of those types of nations, that government that will destroy and, de and break into pieces the many other governments and the polytheism, because the premise is one L under which all men are equal to whom the common law is applicable, which is the Ten Commandments and the judgments right there from Exodus 20 through 23. And then you have a smarting of them through Leviticus and Deuteronomy, right? The, the literal injunctions throughout the Torah, the written instructions throughout the entirety of the books that are still meant and applicable for us today. Not all of them are. We've covered that before. There's added bonds because of transgressions and whatnot. But you get what I'm trying to say. So it says, Concerning him also did Yeremi Yahu foretell, saying, The Ruach before his face, Mashiach Yahuwah, was taken in their snares, of whom we said, Under his shadow we shall live among the nations. Lamentations 4.20 Yehezkiel also and the following foretellers affirm everywhere that he is the Mashiach Yahuwah, the king, the judge, the lawgiver, the messenger of the Father, the only begotten El. Him, therefore, do we also preach to you and declare him to be El, the word who ministered to his El and Father for the creation of the world. By believing in him, you shall live, but by disbelieving, you shall be punished. For he that is disobedient to the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of Elohim abides on him. Yahuchanan 3.36 Therefore, after you have kept the festival of Shavuot, keep one more week's festival, and I put in brackets the Chodesh of the first of the fourth month, and after that fast, for it is reasonable to rejoice for the gift of Elohim and to fast after that relaxation. For both Moshe and Eliyahu who fasted 40 days, and Daniel for three weeks of days did not eat desirable bread, and flesh and wine did not enter into his mouth, but Baruch Hanan, or Hana, when she asked for Shemuel, said, I have not drunk wine nor strong drink, and I pour out my soul before Yahuwah. First Shemuel 1.15. The shepherd of Hermas also mentions that anyone who wants, you want your prayers heard, you got to fast afflict your being if you really are sincere and it's a desire that you really want accomplished make sure you're not sinning abstain from desirable meats and drinks no wine no meats what you would spend on yourself give to someone in need and make your petition known and i i won't guarantee you anything but he promises in his word that he will do the thing that you ask if you say so in belief. And that's the way he told us to do it. I've done it. I've had my prayers answered. Others have done it. They've had their prayers answered. I suggest you you can try it if you believe. And as you believe, let it be to you. All right? <clears throat> it says, and the Ninevites, when they fasted three days and three nights... Yona 3.5, escaped the execution of wrath. And Esther and Mordecai and Yahudith, by fasting, escaped the insurrection of the unrighteous Holfrains and Haman. And Dawid says, my knees are weak through fasting, and my flesh fails for want of oil. Do you therefore fast and make your petitions of Elohim? We enjoin you to fast every fourth day of the week, and every day of the preparation and the surplusage or the yeah the surplus of your fast bestow upon the needy every sabbath ex day accepting one rejoice for he will be guilty who of sin who fasts on yahuwah's day or yom being the yom of the resurrection or during the time of shavuot or in general who is sad on a festival day to yahuwah for on them 
we ought to rejoice and not to mourn. And I said, see also the shepherd of Hermas, book three, parable five. All right. And then one more time, real quick, just for context, keep the Hodesh, the Pesach week up to first fruits. You count your 40, you have your ascension. Your 10 days later is your Shavuot. And you keep your one more festival right here, as it mentioned, excuse me. And then it mentions to fast because now you've got a lot of free time before you have any festivals coming up. Wine, oil, and wood are offerings that are enjoined for believers to give of those substances to the Kohanim, the offerings that would be brought in the land for the services of the Hekel during the year. Okay. We don't, we don't have that. We don't do the Shavuot with the, the loaves when bring them in or the wine or the oil or wood, because we don't do these offerings. There's no sacrifices that you offer those things on. You are to bring in the, uh, tithes and things that are enjoined in the apostolic constitutions and mentioned in the scriptures as the laborers being worthy of their wages and helping those in that are in need truly widows orphans and strangers of the assembly um and that's to be done but not currently like in this fashion so during this time is when you can fast regularly and you can do uh, a long period abstaining for three weeks like Daniel or whatever, or you do your regular fourth and sixth day fasts. But this is the time after the festivities where you fast, and then you have your festivities, and then you fast, right? You have some festivities, and you fast. You have some festivities, and you fast. So you get the, you get the same picture over and over again. And a cycle of doing these things in his word that you can see both here and in what's laid out in the the apostolic constitutions um which really foretells the future too we've covered it a little bit but we'll get into more detail with the creation of the world and then the exodus bringing the people out and they were like the barley harvest that were delivered from egypt with the crossing of the red sea to become his first fruits and then during the time of judges it's mentioned like they're a barley loaf. It also alludes to them as fruit trees and things of that nature, which goes along with the cough leading up to Lamed. But then by the time of Shavuot, they're born again. That's right here. So you have from the beginning of creation with the Exodus, the time of Judges, the time through the Kings and all those things, all the way up to Shavuot. And that's just the spring season. Then you have after he came, and the times of the martyrs and their offerings, which would be the, the wine, the oil, the wood. And that leads to his trumpet call, the mourning for what we've done, and regathering to him to dwell temporarily and with temporary dwellings. And this is reminiscent of like the millennial reign, because the millennial reign is not our permanent dwelling with him. The creation hasn't been restored all the way. And there's still people who will live be born and die during that time, just not those that are of the first resurrection. Those would be the ones that are like the servants that are made the wood gatherers, the water gatherers uh, during the time of Shalomo, or the Canaanites that had made the covenant with Yahushua, son of Nun, when he went into the land as a foreshadow of those things, right? But they're, they're the mortals that will be reigning over for a thousand years. And after that time is when the temporary dwelling's done and where it's forever with them. So this will not be for the forever, but that's what that alludes to. So, Abuling, these things were edifying and they will help everyone who hears it. So um, thank you for your time. Uh, we'll stop for questions and everything on our own. So Shavuot Tov, have a wonderful Shabbat, the rest of this uh, Yom, and we will see you next week.